Okay, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the next session in the Electricity Storage Network uh, Annual Marketplace, which uh, we are looking at the dash for transmission. My name's Ollie Franklin, and I'm a senior project manager at Regen. We manage uh, the Electricity Storage Network, and I'll be kind of sharing today's session and taking you through the wonderful world of transmission connections for uh, electricity storage over the next hour or so. Fantastic. Um, so if we just move to the housekeeping, just so we're all on the same page before we get going into the nitty gritty. Hope you all have all had a nice lunch and are feeling uh, in, in a good energy after lunch, got some caffeine back inside you. Um, but I'm looking for some questions. So as chair, I'll be monitoring the Q&A closely. So please do use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen if you're on Zoom um, for questions. And just a reminder, it's useful to put the questions in the Q&A rather than the chat. The chat is there um, just for a kind of discussion board mainly around the topics we're discussing today. So please do use that as an opportunity to ask our panelists some interesting questions from your point of view. Um, and also a reminder to uprate those questions. So it's really useful from, from me as a chair's perspective to kind of see which are the most popular questions so that I can kind of pick the right ones to ask. So do, do use uh, that uprate function in Zoom as well. And then also a reminder that um, all these sessions will be available on demand um, on the Hoover platform. So it's not just Zoom, there's a the Hoover platform has all of these sessions and all the recordings will be going up there. And there's a, there's a resources section to that. So if you go down on the left hand side of the screen, there's a resources tab there. Um, so they'll all be available on demand uh, for, your, for your viewing. And we'll be adding some other resources to that, which I'll talk through in just one second. And if you've got any technical issues, uh, Hannah and my colleague Estelle as well, will be able to deal with those. And the emails will be popping up in the chat uh, very shortly. So you, you can contact them if you've got any Technical problems. Fantastic. So just to set the scene, uh, I've got a couple of slides just to so that we can kind of see the context uh, of, of what we're talking about here in terms of uh, transmission connections for electricity storage. And this is a bit of work that uh, my colleague uh, Ray and uh, Bruce have been doing. And they've done a, a podcast, which again will be available on the Hoover platform for your viewing. Um, which delves into a bit more detail. And I'm just going to summarise just with a very quick couple of slides and some of the work they've been doing. Uh, so you can, you can watch that and watch that and watch that separately. But so if we start on this first slide here, um, we're, we're looking really at the, the scale of the pipeline that is coming through, um, which is really significant. Um, particularly for uh, transmission over the last few years. It's really the, the pipeline for transmission has really only appeared in the last few years. And there's obviously distribution has been probably the focus to a certain extent over the, the, the past kind of two to three years. Um, but now transmission is really getting a lot more attention, which is why uh, we're here talking about it today. And what's the scale of that? So I think in terms of connected assets, very limited at the moment in terms of the transmission battery storage, particularly. I think there's two sites um, so far, um, but they've got a huge pipeline around 10 gigawatts on the screen, but 12 gigawatts overall, um, because this is, um, there has been some updates uh, over the, uh, the last few months. And, and definitely every time you go back to uh, the transmission uh, capacity register, there is more adding, adding on. So worth keeping an eye on that, but this is this is from November 21, uh, which we've got the uh, kind of figures for. So a lot of capacity coming on around at least 12 gigawatts or so of battery storage, and also a couple of other technologies there, not just battery storage, cryo batteries, liquid area energy storage, around 200 megawatts of that as well, something to look out for. But again, I'll just refer you or signpost you to uh, Ray and Bruce's um, podcast for more, for more information on that. And just an, on the next slide, uh, I'll just talk about where is this pipeline located. So on the left, you've got current uh, connected capacity. And um, on the right, you've got uh, kind of new pipeline projects that are looking to connect. 
So what, what's fairly clear to see is that, that the pipeline is really significant, particularly in, in Scotland, um, compared to the connected assets, um, but also a very significant amount of uh, pipeline projects. And this is just a tra this is just transmission as well, just a reminder. Um, looking to connect in the kind of the national grid ET area as well, energy transmission area. So a big pipeline of transmission uh, look, transmission batteries looking to connect, and they're also looking to connect in other areas, particularly Scotland as well as, uh, as in England. So this is why we're having this discussion today, and this is the, the point of the session, is to really unpick some of the reasons why this, this pipeline has got so big so quickly, and one of the benefits and drawbacks of, of, of connecting the transmission transmission network scale. Fantastic. Okay, so um, we have two panelists to talk this through with today, um, kind of leaders in the field, um, a stellar, stellar panel for, for you to, um, for your audience today. So I'll just let themselves introduce themselves because they are the one more than I, uh, but I'll ask uh, Catherine to introduce herself first, and then we'll move on to Nathan. So Catherine, if you could introduce yourself, your organization, and then perhaps just quickly comment on why you're interested in transmission connected batteries and electricity storage more generally. Absolutely. Catherine. Thanks very much, Ollie. And uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. So uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm uh, Catherine Cleary and I'm a network engineer for Road Knight Taylor, who are grid consultants um, who support um, a number of developers uh, across the sort of uh, various uh, energy markets and um, connecting at both transmission and distribution level. Um, we support projects through from sort of initial conception and grid feasibility sort of type studies um, all the way through to, um, to commissioning. Um, and over the last 18 months, we've seen a number of projects at a transmission level, a very significant increase in the number that, that we previously dealt with, uh, both in the energy storage world and also kind of looking at hybrid projects uh, across uh, perhaps other generating technologies combined with energy storage. Um, and over that sort of last 18 months, we, we've definitely seen some kind of additional new risks and opportunities and um, sort of come out of that, that dash for transmission. Um, so uh, that's what we'll, we'll probably be adding to the conversation today. Fantastic. Thanks, Catherine. That's really interesting to see. Um, Nathan, if you introduce yourself, and again, why is this an interesting area from you? I think I, I think I know why, um, but uh, I'll let you introduce uh, that, that point. Nathan. Thanks, Ali. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nathan Murray. I'm an engineering manager at Pivot Power, and we are an electrical energy storage developer focused on the UK, and we're very proud to um, have commissioned the first transmission connected uh, lithium ion battery energy storage system in the UK, possibly even the second as well, which went online um, Q4 of, of last year. We're exclusively uh, so far at, at Pivot, a transmission developer. We, we um, have around over 35 sites still developed uh, in the tech register on the transmission system. And we were very lucky in 2020 to be acquired by EDF Renewables, which is one of the largest investors in renewable energy technology in the UK, uh, to become you know, a full end-to-end -end developer, um, builder, and, and owner and operator of, of renewable energy assets. Fantastic. Thanks, Nathan. Okay, so just to unpick that a little bit more then, so I think it might be worth starting with you, Nathan, then in terms of what's the kind of the, the pivot power model and why you've chosen to connect to the transmission scale, which was, I suppose, uh, slightly different to the kind of existing pipeline of projects that were really focused on the distribution scale. What, what, what were the benefits? What were the opportunities? What, why did you go for, for the transmission connections? If you could just outline that, it'd be great. I think the pivot power story and the transmission story probably starts about four years ago when pivot was starting as a company, we wanted to become an um, uh, investor, uh, developer of energy storage assets within the UK. And we looked at the opportunities for grid connection. Um, with distribution connections, of course, there's, there's loads of distribution um, points around the UK, but there's, there's a big range of costs. We find that you know it can be very expensive or it can be very inexpensive and it becomes a bit of a postcode lottery with a very long queue. Uh, and you know, the opportunity we identified four years ago was that actually there were quite a number of tertiary 50 megawatt type of connections available with National Grid, but it, wasn't, it didn't seem to be a very popular way to connect 
to the grid at that point. So there did, did seem to be a shorter, relatively shorter queue, maybe a, a quicker way to get to market than going through a traditional distribution network pathway. And the story we like to tell is, you know, at that point, National Grid might have been used to uh, approving 17 transmission connections a year. Uh, within six months, Pivot Power had applied for 50. And it really changed the way that I, we think Grid had to work with um, uh, developers. It, it was a risk for us and we've been working through it. We've been learning a lot, uh, but we feel very fortunate to have gotten to a point where yeah, we, we have commissioned and are currently trading uh, two 50 megawatt transmission connected um, batteries today. Excellent. And I think you mentioned you've got some kind of a award in your office for having the first transmission connected uh, batch storage system, which is a lovely thing to have. Yeah, we, we're quite quite pleased that, that even Grid, I think, is, is proud of, of the achievement of you know, having this, this these batteries export onto a tertiary connection on National Grid substation. Fantastic, that's useful. And in terms of, I think it's, it's fair to say as well, maybe just adding to that is that it's not just just the battery, is it? it? It's kind of there is other reasons why you've done that kind of tertiary winding connection, looking at trying to add some load uh, to to those kind of thirty three kV. Networks. Could you unpack that a bit and talk that through just briefly? Yeah, well, another advantage it can be an advantage for a transmission connection is, is it can be a relatively less constrained. That, you know, if grid has a bay, grid has capacity, the connections that we have, you know, are 50 megawatts down and 50 megawatts up. Um, and if you think about energy storage, a lot of um, the revenue opportunities for the storage asset might be when you're exporting, just providing that maybe a low frequency dynamic containment, discharging a battery into the balancing market for charging. Um, you're really just looking for low price opportunities for the battery. But um, one way we're trying to um, leverage that connection when it's not in use or is, is to share it with other sources of demand, um, other, other fast growing sources of demand, such as. Um, EV charging stations that need to be placed throughout the UK data centers. Um, we, uh, we, when we worked through our pipeline and our develop and how we picked our grid connections with National Grid. We looked at yes, is there empty tertiary at that point, and is it near a major motor artery within the UK? And so we're working with um, different uh, local councils, cities, charge point operators. They're looking for high power um, connections, but yeah, might still also see that same issue where DNO might be either expensive or slow based on what they're looking for. Yeah, really interesting, that that kind of that dual business model to a certain extent. And NGC Super Oxford obviously now kind of operational and now getting some connections on in terms of the, 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 the rapid charging hub as well. Um, Catherine, if, can I bring you in there as well in terms of maybe just providing a bit of a wider view of, of, of some of that? So you said particularly the last 18 months has been an uptick. Is there, what kind of models, what kind of scales? You said there's a kind of mix of technologies. Could you just cover that a little bit in terms of, in terms of your viewpoint on that? Yeah, definitely. And I think um, it's probably important to say that whilst we've seen um, some of the early activity on tertiary winding connections that, that Nathan's mentioned there, um, probably if we, if, you know, if you were to look at, at the kind of national grid tech registers uh, a year ago today, you would have seen, as Nathan says, you know, that that kind of initial rush of applications, many of which came from Pivot, um, but, but, you know, of those successfully contracted tertiary windings. And, and I think that was a little bit of a, a micro gold rush in itself. But since then, I think, you know, perhaps some people in the industry thought that would, would be a bit of a bubble. Um, I think since then, I completely agree that, that grids have changed their way of working with developers. I think they have really proactively engaged with energy developers of, of smaller scale projects historically. And what that's done is kind of opened the floodgates to perhaps larger non-tertiary winding connections. So developers looking at potentially 200, 300, 400, even 800 megawatts um, connecting on to national grid through a 400 kV bay connection at a substation, um, even looking at establishing new transmission nodes. Um, so that's a fundamental shift that we, we had not seen at all before sort of 12 months ago. And I think in terms of the numbers, you know, going back to your opening slides, Ollie, that sort of, uh, I, I think we had sort of about, about eight gigawatts, something in that kind of region of, of tertiary windings applied for and contracted, um, you know, but we're now up at, at three times that, you know, and I think that that increase is not because we've suddenly found some more tertiaries, 
um, it's because we've got people applying for much larger connections. Um, and I think a lot of those people who we work with, they are developers, uh, you know, very established renewable energy developers, potentially in the solar market, who have, have looked at the transmission opportunity. They've looked at some of the kind of progress that's been made in terms of consenting large scale solar um, through the DCO process. And, and I think picking up on what Nathan said, you know, they, they've looked at that connection asset and said, right, well, actually, if we are going for a large scale 400 megawatt transmission connection, we want to maximise the use of that connection asset. Um, and therefore, you know, it makes sense to think, could I add import capacity to that as well? Um, I, think, I think it's something which, which people have you know, struggled with recently on the distribution networks. They're actually kind of trying to create these hybrid projects where you've got good export opportunities and good import opportunities at the kind of 50 megawatt scale is getting harder and harder. You know, normally the import will, will break the network at that stage. Um, and, and I think whereas at transmission level, actually adding import capacity in some of these areas is, is not a problem. And so, you know, you've got this beautiful opportunity for a nice symmetrical grid connection. Um, and I think that's really uh, attracted quite a lot of developers. And, and, and I think, yeah, I, I crunched some numbers as well. I think of, of that kind of uh, contracted capacity at the moment, uh, only a third of it is energy storage alone. Two thirds of it is energy storage combined with solar PV. Um, so I think at the moment, the, the market is sort of showing that quite clear trend to, to co-located hybrid sites. Fantastic. Yeah, I think that we, we've dubbed it the rise of the mega battery over the last, as you say, 12, 12 to 18 months is that there's hundreds of megawatts uh, kind of projects are, are coming through. And again, I'll, I'll signpost to, to uh, Bruce and Ray's uh, podcast on that, which will be coming live on the Hoover platform tomorrow. Sorry, I didn't mention that. So it will be on there tomorrow. It's not there yet if you're looking for it. Um, so that, that's that's really interesting. So in terms of, so just unpacking why why that's happened, you, you touched on a few of the issues there. So if we could go through kind of what are the kind of clear benefits of connecting that transmission scale, is it because obviously there is a significant cost associated with it and the timeframes might have been a little bit, well, they could, could be quicker depending on where you are in the, in the network, which is what Nathan mentioned, this kind of postcode lottery at the distribution scale. Is there, is there, is there kind of like a cost and benefit? Is there a time frame benefit? Could you kind of talk that through a little bit? Yeah, well, I, I'll take that one first and then see, see what yeah. Nathan thinks yeah, as well. Um, but, but I think um, that, that definitely we see there being some kind of uh, sweet spots in terms of capacity sizes um, for costs. So you know, bearing in mind, uh, national grid infrastructure, apart from tertiary winding connections, um, is primarily 400 kV and 275 kV. You know, the physical connection assets required for any connectee, you know, we, we are talking tens of billions rather than, you know, the, the, the distribution level stuff. Um, so so that, that is what's driving that kind of step up to, to, to looking at the sort of larger 250 megawatt plus schemes, I would say. Um, the I, I think there are some benefits which um, have been, which are perhaps harder to cost, but, but effectively, I think many people have seen a contractual certainty, which comes from the, the grid connection process at transmission as a significant benefit. So, uh, you know, you contract directly with National Grid ESO. Um, you know, there isn't this kind of uh, statement of works process that there has been at distribution level, um, where a lot of large connections have, have contracted with the DNO. You know, their project has been subject to a, a statement of works, a project progression process, you know, which might have gone on for 12 months. Actually, they've got very little control over that um, process. It's sort of a, a process bilaterally between the DNO and transmission. And I think there are a lot of growing frustrations in the industry around some of that. Um, so I think the, 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 the direct transmission application uh, the contract arrangements with NJET you know, have, have a nice sort of um, simplicity to them. I, I think what, what I would say is that behind that perhaps lurks some, some there is still some complication. The, the reality is, you know, our distribution and transmission networks impact on one another. Um, and, and unsurprisingly, we're, we're now seeing the, the reverse issues, you know, the kind of the, the distribution network operators piping up and saying, actually, you know, grid, if you connect, you know, the, the, this many gigawatts, um, onto the networks, potentially, particularly tertiary winding connections have a significant impact on distribution networks. So I think we are, see but but I, but I think the, the perspective perhaps of developers 12 months ago was, you know, we are fed up with the complexities and the sort of changing parameters of distribution. You know, this transmission appears, although we have this high entry price, for that we get this great contract certainty that, you know, that we've got a connection date, grid will work to it, and it, it doesn't appear to have lots of caveats. And I, um, yeah, I, I think perhaps as some of those projects go through the, the motions a little bit, we, we, we are going to unearth some of those caveats. 
Yeah, no, I think we hopefully pick them up in this conversation as well, because I think they're, they're fascinating. If, it, if a little technical, those, uh, those other kind of caveats. But maybe if we go to uh, Nathan, before we do. So obviously, uh, Nathan, you're, you're focused on the tertiary winding uh, connections and that specific model. Um, is, is what, what for you are the kind of key benefits of going down that route? Is it, well, I'm sure you know, you know better than I, but how, I suppose, how have the costs and timescales um, been actually borne out compared to what you perhaps planned initially? Because I'm, I'm sure there, as, we, as uh, Catherine alluded to, there's probably some caveats as well in terms of timeframes and things that you've, you've found over the last few years. Um, Nathan? There are, there are caveats, and I don't, I don't think it's, it's necessarily a paradise, but it's certainly a model that's worked pretty well for us. The fact that we've been able to go with a portfolio approach means that we can sort of juggle sites and opportunities because, yes, National Grid is a big organization. Yes, they're probably not used to working with developers, and we have seen situations where maybe a site we thought would go online 24 actually might go online 29. If that was the only site in our portfolio, right, as a developer, that would be an issue. So having a larger portfolio approach and being able to shuffle sites around, working national grid to work with their programs is in a good relationship for us. Um, and, and, you know, they're, they're adding a great connection at the, or even upgrading a connection at the transmission level can impact, as Catherine said, other users. There's a process called the third party works process, which I think has maybe around two lines in the cusk where, sort of we're relying upon a third party, maybe the DNO to do some work to enable our grid connection with national grid. And we've actually find that there is some friction in that process, particularly around lack of SLAs to get that done in a timely process. Uh, because when we've been in situations where maybe we've made an investment decision, we're still waiting on a third party not related to our project to give us more certainty on the grid connection. So we're really excited about an amendment to the grid code called CMP 328. We think we'll add a more formal process in a couple pages into the CUSC, um, setting out clear costs, timelines, and processes between the national grid, local DNOs, and the party looking to connect in. Um, and yeah, we, we just think that we would love to, for our future connections, to have a more formal process that way. Great. I think uh, that's really useful. Sorry, Catherine, you coming in there? I was going to say, Nathan. I, th I think I agreed. I think uh, I think the industry is probably waiting on a decision, aren't they? On uh, on on on, on three two eight. It's sort of been dubbed the reverse statement of works process or distribution impact assessment, which I think is a good kind of good way of capturing it. Uh, yeah, definitely. So it's kind of I suppose a separate postcode lottery, just on the instead of being on the distribution scale and having the uncertainty of statement of works. In the case of transmission, you, you do have a bit of uncertainty around that kind of reverse statement of works process. But hopefully that will get sorted. Is there, do we have a time frame of implementation of, of that CMP 328? I think it was. Is, uh, is there an idea of when that's actually due to be coming into yeah, in implementation phase? Catherine? Uh, well, I, I was going to let Nathan say. Oh, uh, Nathan, sorry. Probably, probably got Nathan, the inside scoop, more. I suspect. Well, I, I think we're still waiting a, a more formal decision from, from National Grid, but yeah, we're, we're optimistic it might happen this year. I think it's definitely gone to, yeah, to the authority. For Excellent. And in terms of, Nathan, if you could just unpack in terms of the costs then, are the costs for all of your portfolio projects, are they broadly similar in terms of the tertiary winding connections and how that's working out? Are they, or is there, as you say, a, a bit of a variance and Obviously, there's a bit of uncertainty around the third party works that kind of can, can change that quite quickly. But are they broadly working out a kind of similar cost per site? There's not too much variation. It's all a bit site specific. There will be some grid upgrades, um, maybe transformer installations that either National Grid might choose to do or maybe the developer like Gus might choose to do. Um, certainly, that third party works component is a bit of an unknown try to work with you know as quickly as possible to understand what their cost might be to allow uh, or like us to connect but in the grand scheme of things uh, the tertiary connection it won't be too expensive and it won't be the cheapest thing you could find on a distribution network it kind of sits somewhere in between uh, what we're also seeing like Catherine was saying you know on these new big concepts um, there's some really innovative approaches by grid to, to build bigger connections new connections 
And sometimes those connections can be shared by multiple parties. And so it's interesting, we're starting to see maybe alliances of developers working together to on, on the new Bay concept as well. Fascinating stuff. Yeah, I just say lots of innovation there from, and I believe there's a bit of uncertainties, but so it's National Grid ET dealing with electricity transmission, dealing with the connections, and then obviously the markets and services from the ESO. There's a bit of uncertainty in the chat there. So that's, that's, yeah, that's I think how, how it works. Perhaps just probably when Nathan and I have said National Grid, we have generally been referring to National Grid ESO. Um, so we, we, we can we can be better at that. Uh, but 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 it is the ESO, to be clear, who are the parties that are contracting with new applicants. So the applications go in and the ESO are offering um, you know, that contract and responsible for um, ultimately meeting that connection date. Um, National Grid ET um, transmission uh, sit behind scenes there in England and Wales um, to deliver the actual physical infrastructure. Um, and owner operate the infrastructure and, and, and National Grid ET um, you know, have, have counterparties of Scottish Power Transmission, SSE Transmission up in Scotland, um, but National Grid ESO is the ESO are responsible across all of GB. Um, so they're the party we're, we're talking about the most here when, when it kind of comes to the developer interfacing directly with, with National Grid as an ESO. Thanks for that, Catherine, that's very helpful. Fantastic. Um, so in terms of, Catherine, you touched on it in terms of the kind of certainty there and the fact that you're you're contracting directly with the ESO. So would there be kind of benefits in terms of access to markets, access to revenues from, from going for that transmission connections, going for that kind of sec very secure connection of the transmission scale? Is that fair to say? Um, so you, no, but it's a very good plant question, I think, Ollie. Um, uh, I think <laughs> I think um, uh, National Grid as an ESA would say no. I think they'd say, actually, they're looking at, at doing the opposite. Uh, the best value for kind of GB PLC is that National Grid ESO can procure services from everyone. You know, so it shouldn't matter if you're distribution connected or transmission connected. If you're able to offer an electrical service which has an impact, a positive impact on transmission balancing, then it shouldn't matter contractually whether you're contracted to you know, UK Power Networks as a DNO or, um, or National Grid. Um, as, as a transmission connected customer. So I think actually we are getting to the point where, where we can begin to decouple some of those revenue assumptions with the kind of basic transmission connection assumptions or, or distribution connection assumptions. I think what, what I was getting at more in terms of the contractual certainty and the benefits are around, um, we, you know, we, we talked about this uh, issue with statement of works process where DNOs have to talk to grid, we talked about you know, the third party works process where grid have to talk to DNOs um, about the kind of mutual impacts on them. Um, because those processes are quite lengthy and they can add significant amounts of uncertainty, your kind of power as a customer, as a consumer, can be quite limited based on your contractual arrangements. And I think it's worth, although this is the dash for transmission, it is probably worth us alluding to the fact that, that there have in recent months been some quite controversial uh, announcements by DNOs on the distribution side of projects which are going to be significantly delayed um, in areas of, of the east of England, um, also areas of the northwest, as a result of transmission delays. So these, these are things you know, pushing projects out to 2028. Um, and, and arguably, that's because the, the, that's because of faults within the DNO to, to transmission ESO relationship, which those distribution customers have no influence over. So it's it's that it's it's that contractual certainty, the fact that you know, if you're in an area where perhaps there are transmission constraints, perhaps it makes sense to be directly connected with the transmission uh, system operator, uh, as opposed to sitting behind, embedded behind a distribution network operator, where actually your kind of commercial and contractual and just customer interface is limited. Really, really good points, actually, Catherine. That's, uh, that's made it nice and clear for me. Apologies for the, for the disruption there. Um, Nathan, do you have any kind of points on that in terms of is that is that a reason you went down the transmission route in terms of yeah well we were obviously talking about the certainty but maybe if we then move on to the markets and the services uh, is there do you have kind of view on what are the what are the key revenue areas you're looking for as, as a as a developer in those kind of tertiary winding connections where where are you looking which markets are most crucial from your point of view Nathan well yeah I think as um as a developer looking at transmission or distribution, I can't highlight too many major markets like, you know, the, the big ones right now are capacity market, a dynamic containment, um, wholesale energy trading. You know, generally, uh, in my experience, 
doesn't matter too much if you're distribution or transmission connected. Uh, however, as a transmission connected asset, we also have access to other opportunities that aren't as large, but they certainly are real, like providing reactive power services. So as the voltage on the connection changes, we actually are, are obligated to correct those voltage changes through a reactive power compensation service. And, and we can be uh, compensated for that if we pass all these tests, et cetera. Um, I guess that's, that's the original purpose of tertiaries, wasn't it, Nathan? You know, <laughs> tertiaries were designed to connect reactive power compensation. So yeah, if you've got a tertiary winding connection, you should definitely be having that conversation with National Grid. Yeah, it's really interesting. As we talk to vendors who are really uh, comfortable uh, quoting um, energy storage systems to, to distribution networks, they kind of look at us and say, are you sure you really want to do that? Because it's not <laughs> common. And we're like, yes, we do. We, we actually have to. Um, so it's really interesting. And now we're starting to see with Stability Pathfinder uh, Part 3 that's just come out, um, Grid has got some really exciting um, requests for inertia and short circuit level contribution. Um, I think we're, those are opportunities I think we can now participate in probably a bit easier that weren't transmission connected. I think the challenge is, um, I don't know what inverter manufacturers really comply with the Great Britain forming converter code yet. And that's gonna be really exciting to go and go and find out, I suppose. Excellent. I mean, that, that, that sounds like a fun job for you, Nathan, over the next next few few months and years to try and figure that problem out. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, I, yeah, I've touched on a few really interesting points there around new new revenue streams that might be slightly more available, let's, let's say, through the transmission sector, transmission and connection. Um, is there, what, well, Catherine, do you have a view on that? So, I suppose, and a counter to that, maybe is there a push towards transmission because some of the issues around distribution connected uh, electricity storage assets around um, the uh, ERP282 issue. I'm sure Catherine, you'll be able to uh, kind of explain that far better than I could possibly do so. But is that is that a fair driver as well in terms of pushing developers towards transmission? Yeah, I know. I think that is a really good point, actually, Ollie. I think um, increasingly, it, you know, we, we sort of mentioned it glibly that, you know, if you're looking for a 50 megawatt battery connection on the on the distribution network nowadays at 132 kV, you'll often struggle, you know, that, that import capacity will often um, have implications for reinforcement on the network. Um, but, but, but more specifically, there are some battery specific issues where, you know, just ticking that box in the in your G99 application form saying, yeah, it's a battery I want to connect is going to raise some alarm bells. And, um, and, and Regen have been doing some great work. I know we've got Pete Aston on this I think I saw in the chat, um, who I think has sent out kind of, uh, a, a, kind of a bit of an, an overview of this. Um, but in a nutshell, the, um, the networks, a number of DNOs have come out and publicly said that they are very worried about the impact of batteries swinging from import to export on their networks, um, and particularly the kind of impact that has in terms of voltage step change. Um, now, that's it's not something that we have historically really done as a as a uh, as an, as an industry, we haven't looked at, you know, what's the worst case scenario if every battery on, you know, uh, Electricity Northwest's network decides to go from importing to exporting, you know, which in theory they could do if they were all market driven, they might do that. If they were all responding to the same kind of frequency response service, um, then they might do that in an extreme frequency event. Um, and so you've now got network operators looking at that kind of scenario and actually giving that as a reason for not connecting someone. So, um, so I think we, we had a recent case where someone was literally given a connection point about 50 kilometers away from their battery site. And the rationale was, if we connect you into the local distribution network uh, close to your site, you, you cause us to breach these, these P28 limits. Um, and that, that's definitely a discussion for the industry because potentially there we're driving people to the wrong connection solutions um, because of some, you know, perhaps slightly inflexible um, engineering standards. So I think there's a conversation with ENA and the, the industry there about, about varying standards to making sure that we are not, you know, it's, it's the wrong solution, I think, if we're pushing people to, to more costly, you know, be it the 50 kilometers away is obviously, you know, completely non-viable. But, but if we're pushing people to connect at higher voltages at transmission level, and that's not that's not actually necessary, then I think we've, we've come up with the wrong solution. So, you know, yes, I think it's a great move to, to move towards transmission and open up these larger connections. But yes, we have to be realistic about the cost of those connection assets. And therefore, you know, it's, it's not going to be right for everyone. And I think, we, we, you know, the game's not over on the distribution network yet. 
Perfect. Thanks, Catherine. That's very, very clear. Um, just a reminder as well, please do use the Q&A function and um, keep your questions coming in. I'll be, I'll be trying to pick them up and I, I might pick a couple up now if that's good. But just a reminder, please do use that and also remember to uprate them or like them using the, the like tag. Um, I'll take the top one, although it's slightly cheekily, but it's, it's trying to, it's a question around network charging. So is there, is there benefits? Because obviously there's some big changes in the network charging arrangements um, that are in the process of, of being changed um, and some uncertainty still in terms of some of the changes. Is there, a, is there well, maybe Nathan's better place to ask this, but is there a bit more certainty at the transmission level now in terms of network charging? Is there a benefit there for you? Um, well, I don't, uh, I think I know that there are some changes on the way. So I, I'm not sure I would say that there is certainty, but there definitely is geographical diversity in, in that. And so it does become interesting from a developer perspective. You know, what sites do you prioritize? Um, is, is it a site with a high to nuance charge for transmission charges? Is there possibly a to nuance benefit? Sometimes there are opportunities to even make that a revenue stream if it's advantageous, but I, I would be having a difficult time contrasting between the distribution level charges maybe Catherine could comment on that yeah I mean at distribution level in general um being extremely uh speaking extremely broadly um it, it, it is true to say that the distribution use of system charges duos what, what people will be used to seeing um especially as a kind of you know, medium scale uh embedded you know 30 megawatt battery for example um paying duos on the 33 kb network um Broadly speaking, your transmission charges at the extremes, you know, so if you're in North Scotland, your tenuous charges for a battery in the same location would be much higher. Um, so, so, so there is a penalty there for going up to that transmission level. Um, and, and the opposite, you know, if you were um, down, you know, in London, um, Kent, the Chilterns, um, you know, effectively feeding the load areas of our country, um, you know, your, your, your generation tenuous, um, your charge for transmission would, would be a credit um, at the moment. Um, whereas at distribution level, you would still be paying um, GEOS charges, uh, distribution system charges as a cost. So, so there is definitely a difference. And, and in general, if you're in an area where GEOS charges are high, then there might be a benefit to being embedded, um, uh, i.e. connected distribution. Um, if you're in an area where GEOS charges are, are a credit, then actually you know, there's no benefit to being a distribution from a, from a GEOS perspective. Um, but it is highly site specific. So, um, and, and I think that the one thing which is, I think people get quite excited about the opportunity to make revenue out of use of system charges at transmission level, but obviously it changes, you know, and, and we, and I think that there's, there's no more obvious case in points for that than some of the um, power stations we've seen that have closed, you know, over, over the last sort of five years, you know, you, you've seen some significant impacts of some of the tenuous uh, revisions, the last tenuous revision um, had on, on things like coal plants in Scotland. So, um, you know, you can't build can't build an asset which has a 25 year lifetime off the back of, of a potential to nuance benefit that we might only know about for the next couple of years. So I think it's important to factor in, but it's never going to be something that you can rely on and, and a bankable revenue stream. Fantastic. Thanks, Catherine. Um, I'll try to pick up another question around the 50 megawatt size connection sit firmly on the rather artificial border between transmission dis distribution. I think, Catherine, you've already, already mentioned this, would greater transmission distribution integration in the industry be helpful? I think broadly, yes, <laughs> it's the, um, the, the short answer. As was, how, how does that happen is, a, is a, probably a, a more a, a tricky decision. Um, we talked about this kind of third party process getting sorted a bit in terms of the transmission down. Uh, and the statement of works the process, I think, has improved, but is still very difficult and uncertain. Is that fair? Is there anything to yeah. measure? That? I think perhaps we're still at the stage of really fleshing out what the problems are. Um, and and uh, well, I, um, that's perhaps disingenuous in that this this modification proposal, CMP three two eight, um, proposed by SSE, by the way, as a distribution uh, network operator, great proposal. Um, and um, you know, just to give credit where credit's due, um, and um, I think yeah, I think everyone's really quite uh, hopeful that that will that will add clarity. Um, but but probably just going back to the DNOs side of things, that that will help uh, projects connecting in at transmission level have clarity on that that sort of third party works piece. Um, but it, it, it we've still got kind of learning and all industry learning probably required to, to help us resolve the transmission impact assessments that affect distribution customers. So I think I think we might still be talking about this in a few years' time. <laughs> Yes, plenty more problems uh, to come up in the next few years, I'm sure. And I suppose that that 
uh, it's, it's kind of related to that point as well, but that, that 50 megawatt planning limit that was there um, is obviously now being removed, which is why we're getting those mega batteries um, come through. Uh, is that, that that's definitely the, the case from your point of view? So that, that's a crucial change that's happened in the, since like, mid-2020 as well in terms of opening up those larger batteries. Yeah, they're going back to what we said about the, the, the number of transmission connections which are co-located, where we've got multiple energy sources. That 50 megawatt limit is obviously still there for things like solar. Um, so we, there is a bit of a gap if you look at the tech register. You won't find many projects in the sort of over the 57 megawatt capacity, which is the sort of 57 MBA is the kind of thermal capacity of a tertiary winding. Um, so you've got the smaller connections which sit on the tertiary winding, and then you, you probably won't see many connections above that until you get to the kind of 200, 250 megawatt mark which is where it starts to appear to become cost viable again um, for, um, for schemes which, um, which, which would need to go through the DCO consent process because they've got large scale solar or something else alongside. Fantastic. Just looking at the kind of other key policy changes that will be impacting that over the next, next kind of few years, perhaps. And so we've, we've talked about the interaction between transmission distribution a bit, we talked about network charging, um, as you, Nathan, you mentioned a few bits about kind of new products coming on the market about reactor power and inertia. Is there anything else in terms of kind of key policy changes over the next few years that will have a, 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 an impact on transmission connected assets and kind of drive more growth, even if, if there needs to be any more <laughs> driven driving growth because there's so much larger pipeline there already. But is there anything else that you guys are really kind of looking at in terms of significant policy changes, policy areas um, that will impact? Uh, this, this yeah, transmission connected assets particularly. Nathan, if we go to you first. Yeah, I, I think the, the only thing that comes to, to my mind, you know, it just is the recent policy change to lift that 50 megawatt limit for energy storage. It's just been phenomenal for the industry. I think four years ago, we thought it was actually quite a good opportunity to get a bunch of roughly 50 megawatt connections that sit conveniently around the planning threshold now that's lifted, um, you are seeing 100, 200 megawatt, I guess yesterday, 400 megawatt size projects in Scotland, which is quite interesting. But as Catherine mm -hmm. was also pointing out, there's been a lot of focus on maybe co-location to, 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 to sweat that uh, grid connection asset for lack of a better term. Right? You've got a, maybe a solar farm using that grid connection 10% of the year. Maybe energy storage could help, help fill the other 90 percent with the revenue opportunity. But if you still have that 50 megawatt threshold on solar, it kind of makes the economics on very large co-located schemes a bit more awkward. Um, so yeah, that, I think certainly we need to build renewables yesterday. We're feeling the effects of that crisis on gas now. And so in my view, um, yeah, providing similar planning advantages to renewables would be would be helpful. No, that's a yeah, it's a, it's a good point, and in terms, it's useful. One of the points that Pivot Power has made over the, the kind of period of you guys have been operational is the, the urgency of getting these connections in and getting the flexibility there quickly, and then also the connections for EV charging hubs because that, that's probably that you could move quicker than distribution connection potentially as well. So that urgency, I think, is is a, a, a good point to to focus on. Um, Catherine, do you have any points on that in terms of kind of key policy areas you're looking at? Um, I think one thing which might be um, worth pulling in is, is going back to your early question about time scale, Ollie. And I, I think it's um, it's worth flagging that perhaps uh, I think Pivot have probably positioned themselves very well in terms of um, some getting some of those earlier uh, connections contracted with National Grid and, and sort of therefore deliverable within a reasonable time frame. Um, applicants today looking at perhaps some of the larger connection opportunities. Um, are really struggling with transmission timeframes. I think it's it's we, should, we shouldn't be clear about that, that that it's not kind of rosy everywhere, and there will be places where you know you you want to build a 400 megawatt battery and you've been given a 2033 connection date. You know, so th there are some really potentially lengthy connection timeframes. And um, very generally speaking, a lot of that is being driven by some of the current very large scale offshore wind plans in the UK, and um, which have a really big um, knock on impact on the trans transmission flows um, on the system. And, and it's worth saying at transmission, we, you know, we still operate a basic queue principle, you know, so it's, it's first apply, you know, first come first serve based on an application date. And um, so you, you, we are finding now that we've got a lot of, you know, these smaller, perhaps more agile players who are stuck in queues behind very large scale 
um, offshore developments, which might take 10 years to realise. And so I, I think we've just mindful that we've just been through a big queue management consultation and, and so on that only kind of came out in the wash last year um i think queue management at transmission could, could come up again um with the idea of perhaps trying to employ some additional sort of flexibility to, to get people on early who are able to deploy quickly yep no again urgency of the situation need to get stuff in the ground as quickly as possible that's that's a good point and yeah and i think you're right other technologies impacting what is a fixed resource within uh, national grid in terms of uh, duration i think that this has been mentioned a few times in the, in the chat around uh, kind of duration of projects versus kind of official capacity um what what are your guys thoughts in terms of your i suppose if we go to nathan first what what size batteries are you are you going for what duration batteries are you going for is that do you have a standard has that changed over time Nathan, if you have a comment on that. Yeah, I, I have a lot of thoughts on um, the economics of energy storage duration. I hope I'll, I'll keep this brief and, and easy to understand. But first thing to recognize with the UK market is it's heavily um, incentivized for energy storage for ancillary services like FFR, dynamic containment. And those are services that, that compensate you on, on proportion of your power capability, not necessarily on the duration of your energy storage asset. So historically, 2017, you were maybe seeing 30 minute lithium ion systems. Since then to about last year, one hour systems were the norm and um, project owners are getting more comfortable in stacking revenue streams. So you don't have to choose, am I gonna focus on its response or focus on the balancing market? You can actually mix both. And the UK has been extremely innovative on that field and we should give national grid a lot of credit uh, for creating this market. Um, but yeah, will we see two hours, four hour systems coming onto the market? At Pivot Power, I can confirm this year we'll be commissioning two two hour systems onto two uh, 50 megawatt connections. So those will be 100 megawatt hours of capacity each. The benefits that we're seeing is that when you go from one to two and then two to four hours, the efficiency of your battery goes up. That reduces your costs and your wastes of losses of energy. We're also seeing vendors getting much more comfortable because there's less you know, heat moving through the batteries at such a short period of time, they can give us much longer warranties. That's just helping compound to a better business case. Today, two hours is the sweet spot. Um, you will get more revenue if you go to four hours, but the, the CapEx probably increases faster than your revenue increases. And so, sort of the local maximum, if you will, is right now about two hours of duration. Let's be mine. Fascinating. That's really interesting. As, as you say, there's been, since 2017, quite a big change in that. And I think we have got a session on long duration uh, battery storage, so, or energy storage, so I would say. So I'm not gonna go too much more into that, but Catherine, do you have a, a kind of point on duration at all? Probably the only thing to add really actually is that um, we often don't see people specify their duration of their batteries until quite a long time after they have got to the position of, of you know, fixing a site, applying for the grid connection. Um, I guess the reason we, from an electrical engineering perspective, grid engineering especially, um, talk about capacity in megawatt terms is, is that is you know, the transmission entry capacity. So we're talking about the, the, the capacity of the grid assets required to connect you. So nowhere in your application um, you know, to, 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 to National Grid, will they ask you what duration of storage you um, implement? And they just want to know what, what your, you know, your actual physical um, rated megawatt capacity is, so your peak power output. Um, so, so we see a lot of people who are probably still undecided and will be undecided until they get to the balance part award. Fascinating. And then, that, yeah, as, as you say, you can be flexible depending on the markets and services available at the time, um, which seem to be, hopefully, as Nathan mentioned, moving towards longer duration. Um, Okay, very interesting. Thank you for that useful discussion. So I think we haven't got too much longer, longer left. I was wondering if you could look into your crystal balls and see what you see in the future. How, how, how will transmission connected assets change over the next few years? We've obviously got a big pipeline and there's, there's you could say, as, as Catherine, you mentioned, some of the connection dates are moving perhaps back further and further. Um, is, is there any other things that you see in your crystal ball that are, are, are kind of uh, really important for transmission connected uh, energy storage? If we start with Nathan, and then we'll go to Catherine for to your kind of future gazing. 
Yeah, so I just want to highlight two things. I think you know, one is um, what we're seeing uh, for new transmission connections that maybe we're looking at is sort of this whole new bay concept. We get a new uh, 275 or 400 kV bay. Um, maybe it's 150 MVA. Uh, maybe we look at um, investing in it ourselves or finding partner developers who want to put a solar plant or wind plant or another storage plant next to us. Um, we're seeing some really interesting advantages there, particularly with cooperation from Australia, which is really helpful. Uh, second thing I want to highlight is that, um, you know, I think Catherine talked about this a little bit, but um, storage can, can be a great network asset. We can help relieve congestion, uh, very flexible if the market signals are there. And so as DNOs maybe transition to a DSO concept, provide uh, markets to allow storage to come in and, and participate and help solve some congestion problems, um, then yeah, we, we could see a swing back to the distribution side. Well, let's wait and see what happens. Fascinating, thanks Nathan. Uh, Catherine. Yeah, I think my, um, I'll pick two then as well. Um, I think uh, probably one, you know, watching the tech register, we should probably just be mindful that I think with that pipeline is, you know, it's not all going to deploy. Um, and, and what happens with a transmission connection in terms of sort of cost risk is slightly different to a distribution connection. You know, you can contract and then um, effectively, I, I'm expecting to see quite a lot of those projects um, mod app, so to seek to delay their connection date, which helps keep their kind of level of cost liability low. So I'm sort of expecting that that, that, that pipeline to potentially divide into the players that are ready to go now versus probably quite a significant chunk of that, which may seek to kind of delay, and they've, they've secured their place in the queue, but we might see those connection dates moving out, which is, I think, just a sign of, of you know, perhaps a little bit of uncertainty around this market for the really large scale stuff. Um, I think the, um, the second thing is probably um, uh, more around the, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think energy storage, um, on the distribution networks, um, as, as Nathan says, from a DSO perspective, could start to um, offer significant benefits. And if we kind of see that, that shift in mentality from energy storage causing all of the problems because it imports, exports, does things too quickly, you know, causes variations on the network to, you know, actually energy storage is a solution, um, then I think um, that, that might seek to kind of open back up and, and coupled with, um, sorry, open back up distribution network kind of opportunities and coupled you know, with this really big change in distribution charging. So the way we, ch we charge um, upfront for distribution connections is changing you know, potentially as of April next year. And I think you know, no nothing is clear in this renewable energy developer market um, until, until we've seen how, how that sort of really actually impacts, uh, impacts final charging um, methodologies. Uh, so we're, we're still expecting an outcome from Ofgem on that uh, off their, their kind of mind to position. Definitely, I think we're, we're on tender hooks for that one, because as you say, it has massive impacts. Um, we do have a poll, uh, which I thought we might just flash up to give us a, a little view on what are the kind of connection voltages that you guys are most interested at the moment. So what are, what are the kind of, what of the projects you're working at on at the moment, where are you looking to connect? So it just gives a bit, us a bit of a snapshot of the people in the room. Um, where are you guys focused on? Um, just uh, yeah, from an interest point of view, because I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued. Uh, so I think anyone's on Hoover should have access to this already, but on the Zoom, um, it's popped up in front of you. So if you could just pop down an answer to that, and then we'll, we'll, we'll show the results in just a second. Um, I suppose, yeah, Catherine, maybe just a quick comment whilst we wait for people to fill that out is that are you, what's the proportion from your kind of customer base? Is it is it, is it erring towards those bay connections now, those very large transmission um, connections, or is it still mostly distribution? Yeah, I was, I was wondering if I was going to be allowed to vote. Um, I, I think I would say that it's it's beginning to err towards the bay connections at 400 kV. Okay. Definitely really? away from tertiary connections, because Nathan's got them all. I was going to say, I think Nathan, I think I know the answer you're going to <laughs> you're going to put down there, but so I, I won't. But no, interesting that you mentioned that you're looking at some consortiums as well, because I think that's that's, that's a really interesting area in terms of sharing that, a, a big larger bay connection. So, and obviously your expertise in getting uh, national grid connections already, you can you put that to, to put that to use. So, um, that's fascinating. If we could share the results, if we haven't done so already, and then we can have a look. 
Uh -huh. Okay, so it looks like Bay 400 kV substation uh, the, on the transmission scale is the most popular, followed by 132 and 33 kV distribution is equal at the moment, 18%, and then tertiary winding a little bit further down, and then after that, 11 kV. Okay, interesting. So, yeah, transmission's where it's at. Well, I suppose with the, the header of a dash to transmission, we probably do get people interested in transmission. So a little bit, a little bit of a self-selecting audience, perhaps, but uh, that's interesting nonetheless. Okay, brilliant. Thanks for all your thoughts. I think I'll just spend uh, another couple of minutes wrapping up. Really, really appreciate your time, Nathan and Catherine. Very much uh, appreciated your expertise, uh, your comments. Um, but fascinating, fascinating area. I'm sure um, we'll probably be running another session like this uh, in a year's time and it will be completely different um, because of the nature of the market at the moment. So uh, thank you very much for, for, for your time. Um, if we could just put up the slides for a second. Um, so just a reminder, um, this is just one part of what the Electricity Storage Network does as an organization. Um, you are uh, able to join us um, as a, on a kind of different levels, depending on, on what your organization is. And we have a really good base of organizations that are already members. So just a, just a final plug uh, to say that please do join if you are not already members of the Electricity Storage Network. Uh, we have lots of working groups uh, working on, on different areas. Uh, we keep you informed on different policy areas uh, and do our best uh, to give you the latest information. Um, and at your fingertips and just a reminder as well the next session is um, tentative, tentatively and uh, we, we did mention a bit of kind of longer duration uh, batch storage but we're now going to be looking at long duration actual long duration uh, batch storage and some of the kind of te technologies that are leading in that area and some of the developers that are leading in that area including Highview Power, um, Scottish Power and others so that session is coming up at four o'clock. Um, so you've got a little bit of time to go and grab a coffee, have a little bit of break, catch up on your emails, and then you're back at four o'clock for the next session. I think I will we'll end a little bit earlier. Um, so thank you very much for your time. And thank you, Catherine, and thank you, uh, Nathan. And as I mentioned, all of these uh, recordings are available on the Hoover platform uh, on demand. Um, so you're welcome to have another look if you missed some of the technical detail we went through uh, in that in the whistle-stop tour of the hour we had. So thanks very much. See you again soon.